Thank you so much, um, everyone, for joining us at our first ever iSchool Student Services Lunch and Learn Workshop Series. We're excited today to talk about the Digital Asset Certificate option and have a Q&A with Pathway Advisors from the MLIS Pathways of Data Science, Digital Curation, Digital Services, and Emerging Technologies. So today's agenda, what certificate pathways are available, why should you complete the certificate, how to complete the certificate, and then you'll meet faculty who actually teach classes that are part of the certificate option. And then at the end, uh, we will open it to Q&A with our faculty advisors. So if you can hang on to your questions and um, we will release the chat um, after the end of the professor's um, little section in this presentation today. So with all that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, what is the certificate program? This is a unique program. It's a nine um, unit certificate program, which is actually stackable within your MLIS or your MARA degree. So um, what you do is um, you don't have to apply separately if you're already an MLIS or a MARA student. Um, there's no additional cost to earn their certificate as an already existing master's student, but um, it is available as a standalone certificate option. And um, MLIS and MARA students would complete nine units of their master's electives from one of the three possible pathways. So the pathways are data analytics and data-driven decision-making or digital assets management or information governance, assurance, and security. Now, these certificate classes pull from the following MLIS pathways, the data science, digital curation, digital services, and emerging technology MLIS pathways. Um, so you would choose one of the three possible options shown here, either the data analytics and data-driven decision-making pathway, where students will learn how to harness big data, visualize information, and use social media for competitive and company research, or the course, um, the digital assets management um, pathway where courses focus on digital content management, digital curation tools and services and new digital media characteristics. Or we offer a third option, information governance, uh, assurance and security. In the data analytics and data-driven decision-making uh, nine unit pathway, students would choose up to six units of electives from the Info 246 series. And you can see some of the topics and when they're offered. You also have the choice of data services and libraries, or you can take some of the 282 classes using social media, project management, change management, or two choices from the 287 series, problem solving with data or collecting and analyzing data for evidence-based decision-making. With the digital assets management pathway, you would be required to take the digital assets management three unit course, that's info 282. And then you choose six units from any of the topics you see here, either metadata, digital curation, tools, services, methodologies, digitization and digital preservation, electronic records, enterprise content management, or encoded archival description. And then with the information governance, assurance and security option, you would actually take all three of the um, classes that are listed here. So two from the MARA program, which are developing an information governance strategy, and um, information assurance. So um, those, those classes, the course numbers will be changing in the future to MARA 286 and 287. And then the third class from this series would be cybersecurity info 287. Uh, MLIS students, if you're not aware of this, are allowed to take up to nine units of their 27 units uh, from the MARA program. Now, why would you want to earn this certificate? You're already here for either a master's in library and information science or archives and records. 
So earning the certificate will help you to distinguish yourself and shine in the job market. And here are just a few of the students that have gone on to earn the certificate while they were here. Um, you can see they come from a variety of work environments, anything from um, McKenna Wolker, who was a Mara student who works in the law firm, to Daniel Goodman, who works for Clinique in New York City, the cosmetics company doing digital assets work, or John Luke Christensen, who works for NASA JPL. So you can see uh, there's a wide variety of applications that these um, skills can be applied to in different in industries. And so um, don't just take it from me, you can visit our website and you will see that we have a lot of profile stories that have been done on students who have achieved the certificate as well as their masters. Um, and you can read these profiles by visiting the link that I have um, on the slide here. This is Kayla Kipps, who was a advanced certificate student, an MLIS student who works in collections assessment. And she says that the skills she gained during the certificate align very well with her job that she has as a collections assessment specialist, because she does a lot with data analysis and electronic resources. Now I pulled out some example job titles that might be working in this with these skill sets from our MLIS Skills at Work Jobs Report. If you haven't had a chance to read through this report, I highly recommend this to um, pretty much everyone I talk to who's considering our program um, because this is a great um, tool and resource to uh, learn more about skills um, in the current um, job environment as it's um, reviewed every single year. And, and you can learn about exactly what skills employers are looking for in these areas. So let's talk a little bit about how. How do you achieve the certificate? Um, all of the certificate electives are available in special session. While some regular session um, topics are available, um, you may need to switch your session to special session in order to get all of them if you are pursuing the digital assets certificate within your degree, within your MLIS degree. And so there is a process to go about switching if you, if you are a regular session student that needs to have access to the certificate classes. Now, how do you plan all this out? How do you achieve all this? Um, you would use the course selection tools on our advising toolkit to plan out your electives and see when those specific elective topics are on offer, such as our rotation tool. You can also search previous syllabi from our advising toolkit as well. And if you want more information, we actually have an FAQ dedicated to the subject of the advanced certificate and strategic management of digital assets and services. So here is the link on the slide to where you can find this detailed FAQ all about this program. So at the end of your master's program, what you will do is you will be downloading this advanced certificate audit form from our website. You will fill it out with the nine units of electives from your master's program that fulfill one of the three pathways. And you will drop this into the Dropbox on our advising site in Canvas. And you need to wait until a grade of CR or credit appears on your uh, unofficial transcript from the semester in which you took either Info 289 or Mara 289. And so that in tandem with your candidacy form will be on file for you at the graduate admissions office when they go to evaluate you for graduation. So that when you graduate, you'll receive both the master's and the advanced certificate. And those would be mailed to you by our graduate admissions and program evaluation office. Make sure that um, all the units followed for the certificate appear on your candidacy form. If you are a student that's considering um, pursuing this certificate option outside of the master's program, then you would complete a digital portfolio at the end of the certificate units in lieu of the, uh, the um, e-portfolio 
exit requirement. So that's how that would work if, if you were to come in and take the certificate separately. And now it is my great pleasure to get to introduce um, some of our wonderful faculty advisors from Related Pathways to the Advanced Certificate. And they were here to talk to you a little bit about their classes and promote their classes to you um, as we are getting close to registration time for summer and for fall. So it's very exciting that they're here to share their time with you today. And first up, we have Dr. Allman. And so I will go ahead and turn off my video and my mic and take it away. Thank you, Sheila. And hello, everyone. Um, being mindful of the time, we want to make sure that we have um, sufficient time for your questions at the end. But please do not hesitate to contact me um, after this session is over if you have any questions. Um, I uh, have a lot of my hands in a lot of different areas in the school. And if I were a student in your position, I think I would be completely overwhelmed with the amount of courses that are available and trying to figure out which ones to choose. So my first piece of advice, um, if you're trying to decide which certificate you're interested in, is start to look at job ads and see which ones um, appeal to you and what are their requirements. And when you know that, then it can help you to select the courses um, in the, or select which certificate you want. And that is a big boost uh, to your resume, uh, your credentials, having a certificate. Um, but it's not absolutely vital um, if you want to be a more generalist. Um, I have the advantage of seeing all of the curriculum. I'm co-chair of the curriculum committee, and I can tell you that San Jose's iSchool either has the most robust um, curriculum of any accredited program. At, we're high up there if we're not the most. Uh, so you've got um, so many courses from which to choose. I also am co-chair of the leadership and management pathway. And I work with a lot of library and information profession leaders and directors. And what they say is that they would like to have starting employees who are as technologically savvy as possible, along with the soft skills. So make sure that you have a mix, um, that you are able to be a team player, that you have some uh, technology background with you. Um, I also teach a course called the Emerging Future Technology Issues and Trends. And that is a three unit course that's offered every spring term. And we look at a wide variety of topics, some in depth uh, and at least 30 that are um, more broad based. So some of the things that we look at, um, we have Dr. Chen, who's going to be talking um, about big data, probably. But we look at big data. We look at privacy. Um, we look at blockchain. We look at um, how to do grant proposals to fund the technology. And then some of the other topics that we examine that are really current, and they may not be related specifically to archives or libraries or other information professions, but they do impact society and they impact us and our users. So we will look um, more broadly at robotics, AI, um, transportation, both um, on earth and in outer space. We look at transhumanism. Uh, so it gives a wide variety of um, topics that are in the emerging technologies. And then you have the opportunity to specialize in other courses. And I want to encourage you to take advantage of the one and two unit courses that are available. Um, some are in 281, Info 281, Info 282. Um, there's an Info 240, I forget the exact one, will give you some special topics in that area. So you never really know um, what your career is uh, going to, how it's going to evolve. So you want to look at um, the skills that you already have so that you can um, uh, have transferable skills, uh, the courses that you take. Uh, now, the experiences that you have to make yourself as marketable as possible. So choose wisely. Uh, you can always come back as a uh, post graduate uh, to take other courses, but you want to be able to make yourself 
um, as marketable as possible and to have um, a wide variety of courses that are of interest to you. So please um, let me know if you have questions and I will turn it back to you, Sheila. Fantastic. Um, next we have Dr. Chen. Is Dr. Chen ready? Yes, I am. Okay, thank you, Sheila. And thank you, Dr. Allman for offering such insightful and helpful um, suggestions about the certificate, um, about thoughts on the certificate and also how to look for jobs and know, kind of know how, what you're interested in. And I um, completely agree with Dr. Allman, especially on the point that it's um, really desired in current job market to have that good balance of soft and hard skills. And also from my own experience, because I came from a very technical background, I see that um, my former students who landed on a really good um, data analytics or um, related jobs, they all have that good mix of um, for example, a library focus area like digital curation, digital asset management, plus some of the data analytics tool and software skills. So I think it's really that balance that people are looking for right now. So for myself, I teach big data analytics and management in the fall and information visualization course in the spring. And if you are interested in learning how we could manage, analyze, and especially interpret and present data, then I suggest that you take one of these two courses first to see how you like it and whether this is what you're looking for and kind of get you started. So the information visualization course does not necessarily deal with large scale data. Instead, we discuss different approaches to visualizing different types of data from small to large and from you know, corporate, corporate data to social media data. We also talk about topics related to the design part. For example, what are some of the key design principles and how does human perception work when being presented with a visual design? So um, some experience in using very basic Excel is encouraged as for the main part of the course, we will focus on learning more advanced visualization tools such as Tableau and uh, raw graphs and having some experience in Excel will help greatly smooth out the learning curve. And the big data analytics and management course focuses mainly on big data. So while information visualization could be part of the big data analytics and management paradigm, we will only spend about a week on that topic. And for the remaining lessons, we will cover various big data topics, such as NoSQL database management, big data mining, big data analytics using software tool called Splunk. And that is, um, a very popular tool right now that people use, uh, for example, for internal uh, organization auditing to evaluate student success at universities. So a lot of academic institutions are using that too. So, um, well, programming experience is not required in this course, um, but Splunk does work like more like a scripting type of language. So where you would love to have or um, to be able to learn some of the logical and more analytical thinking. And that plays an important role in this course. So um, this is the, the two courses that fulfill the data analytics and data driven decision making uh, pathway and also the data science path career pathway in general. And like Dr. Alma mentioned, um, Feel free to email me uh, with your questions, any thoughts for suggestions um, after the session. I'm very happy to help. Thank you, and back to Sheila. Oh, thank you for those great, um, excellent examples from your course, that's really helpful. Um, next, we're going to go on to Dr. Hoffman. So take it away, Dr. Hoffman. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, I want to echo what Dr. Allman and Dr. Chen said, that having the mix of hard skills and soft skills is vital in the job market. But if you are not a technical person by background and you're going, oh my gosh, that's okay. I was an English major followed by a law degree before I came into my MLIS and PhD. And you absolutely can learn these skills through the program. So don't be scared off of the tech if you don't already have a tech background. Uh, I teach digital curation and I kind of joke that it's um, 
a course each week. You know, we spend a week on metadata and we have a fantastic metadata course in the program. We spend a week on digital preservation. We have fantastic digital preservation courses. So it's a really good kind of overview of um, all the different components that go into digital curation and the way they fit together. Um, I'm also your person to talk to for all things archives and records management. And I would love to hear from any of you if you have any questions. And I will hand it back to Sheila. Okay, fantastic. So Dr. Liu, you are next. Yeah, I'm here. I'm trying to start the video. Um, the room is a bit dark, so I hope you can see me fine. And welcome everybody to the session. I'm so glad to see that uh, you're interested in the uh, um, the, the big data, uh, uh, data analytics and uh, all this big data thing and this uh, pathway and certificate. Um, I teach uh, many uh, two courses that I think are closely related, related to your interest. Um, one that is listed at the top on the screen, and that's one it's about data mining. Um, you heard Dr. Chen uh, talk about uh, data analytics as well, right? But uh, her class using a, a, a different tool. Um, in my class, I use a, a GUI uh, in, interface uh, tool that is known as a rapid miner for text money and uh, data money. The nice thing is that all the major data mining algorithms uh, are turning into uh, pre-built modules uh, as part of the system. So all you need to do is to construct a main computational process by assembling those building blocks graphically. So it's a really handy tool and students enjoy it, had a lot of fun and uh, you get to taste and learn how to do data mining uh, without getting into any, into any programming business. So you don't need to know any computer program language. Um, the other one is the uh, database management. Uh, that's uh, information 242. Uh, that might comes handy if you need to set up a small database to manage your digital collection. And uh, in that class, we learn from scratch how to take a business scenario and analyze it to come up with the initial design and then a, 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 a refine the design and finally implement the database, the whole database uh, in Oracle system through its web interface. Uh, that's known as Application Express. So I really look forward to uh, talking to any of you. Um, if you have any more questions or want, want to just to learn more about uh, one of those courses that I'm teaching. And uh, looking forward to working with you all. Have fun. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for giving those excellent examples of the specific software applications that they might pick up from taking your classes. And next we go to Alice Scott. Hi, Sheila. I'm, uh, and everyone. I don't know if my, if my video is showing or not, but I think it's on. Anyway, um, I teach two courses in the digital assets management pathway. In the spring, which I'm teaching right now, uh, digitization and digital preservation. And this is a really, um, mostly it's about digitization. It's just a kind of a touching on digital preservation. We kind of talk about it all semester, but there's a little bit at the end of the semester, kind of a little bit more of an intro to it. But one of the tools that we use in uh, this class is Content DM. And I think that that is becoming quite ubiquitous out in the, out in the real world there. So um, my students are really uh, right in the middle of it right now, as a matter of fact. And the one that I teach in the fall is the tool services and methodologies for digital curation. And in that class, we talk about uh, life, life cycle models for digital curation. We talk about um, resource management systems. We talk about trusted digital repositories. We talk about maintaining the authenticity of digital files. And then we look at a lot of different tools for performing specific repository functions. 
And the final thing in that class, the final assignment in that class is actually um, a web archiving assignment. And so my students use Archive It, which is um, related to the internet archive and all of their collections, they curate a collect, uh, collection of sites that they then archive permanently for the web. So anyway, I just really look forward to talking to anyone who needs some advice in this area or if you have any questions. And I also want to re-echo what all of my colleagues have said previously, and that is that employers really are looking for technology as well as soft skills like management and leadership communication skills, all of those things are just as important as the technology skills, <laughs> to me anyway, and I know that they are to, to uh, employers as well. So anyway, I will turn it back over to Sheila, and thank you, everybody. Well, thank you so much. Um, we enjoyed hearing all those examples. Um, our final speaker for the um, for this section of our workshop is Dr. Michael Stevens. So please go ahead and take it away. And Dr. Stevens, we have a little bit of extra time, so feel free to use up all that extra time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, thank you, Sheila. Thank you so much. And I will agree with everything that my colleague said about everything, about soft skills, about leadership, about all of those things. And um, uh, let's dive in. I, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, what I do, about a course I teach, etc. I advise in the pathways you see there, um, and I teach. Uh, I coordinate for uh, for the school Info 200. So if you've taken Info 200, you probably see me lecturing in this chair in this room. Uh, and then I teach a class uh, called the Hyperlink Library: Emerging Trends and Emerging Tech. And Sheila, can you advance the slides? Is that the way that works? I pre or can I? Yes. Are I'm you sorry. ready for the next? Are you ready? For yeah. The next I'm just, and okay. just let me know, and I'll be. Oh, okay. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's go all the way back to 200 for a second. And you probably in 200 encountered Rangan Ranganathan, who said the library is a growing organism, and we are seeing that. And really in what we're talking about today with so many things going digital and balancing out technology and meeting people's needs, et cetera, and creating collections for people to access from wherever they are. So with that in mind, um, I wanna tell you a couple of things. First, I'll talk a little bit, and this is a lovely slide to have up to, for uh, the Hyperlink Library. Info 287, the Hyperlink Library is a technology class uh, no. Yeah, it is a human-focused class masquerading as a technology class. Uh, we do do a lot of work with technology. We talk about social media. We talk about some of the things out there on the cutting edge. And we focus on things like the different environments that you may work in. What does it mean to be the hyperlink school library? What does it mean to be the hyperlink academic library? Um, we look at... Uh, how we reach our communities, no matter who that community is. And we spend a lot of time talking about learning in all of its different forms, including the learning we do as professionals and the learning opportunities that we provide for our users. And one of the things I like to do with this class is provide a lot of choose your own adventure type things. And that happens in a couple of ways. You can come into the hyperlink library focused on academic libraries, school libraries, special libraries, whatever it might be, archives, museums even. And you can do all of your assignments focused on those uh, environments or um, specialities or whatever. The other thing is there are some weekly modules that divide into like six different things. You don't have to do all of them, but you can pick the one that resonates with you the most. And that you remember those books from back in the day, the choose your own adventure, where you kind of find your way. Um, I think we do that like three times in the semester. Uh, in the class, we work on a a participatory service and emerging tech or trend planning document. We write a director's brief or an administrative 
uh, advisory brief on an emerging uh, technology trend or human focused service in libraries. And then we bring it all together and do uh, a symposium uh, at the end where you share uh, your learning. Sheila, if you don't mind, please go to the next slide. I'll watch the time too, I'm sorry. Oh, you're good on time. Okay, all right. So, okay, so in, in thinking about this, uh, and I knew I, that I was last, and I think we went in alphabetical order, which is super cool. So what I thought I would do is just sort of like approach this from what I see going on in libraries, what I hear from the folks that I uh, chit chat with. And I will, I'll put a real fine point on this. Um, just a guest speaker we just had in the Hyperlink Library. We had two. We had uh, Stacy Ledden from Anythink Libraries in Colorado, which she always has such cool things to, to say. But we have Michael Casey, who is Director of Customer Experience at Gwinnett County Public. And I told I we talk a lot about um, what's going on in the field. And he has said, get ready for this. He has said, whenever they open a job and he has a San Jose grad interviewing, they are always the ones that seem just so on top of everything, on top of technology, on top of all of these things I'm gonna to talk to you about real quick and just sort of the whole package. So I think that's, that's so nice to hear that from the field, but I ran these by Michael. I said, Michael, this is what I think I'm gonna uh, share with the folks coming to the, uh, the workshop on advising, et cetera. And he's like, absolutely spot on. So that made me happy. So what I see and what I want to ask you all to do as you choose the courses, in the, in the certificate program or in the pathway that you are drawn to are these things. We really should be focusing on user-centered design and design thinking. And design thinking is one of the classes that appears uh, in the emerging tech uh, pathway, as well as some of the others. A move to more hands-on learning and experience-based opportunities. Now, in the age of the pandemic, there might not be as much hands-on, but that was really ramping up before last year. And I think it will continue once we can all be back in our buildings, be together and be safe. Now that experience-based thing means you're not just coming to the library for a book, a DVD or whatever, but you're coming to have an experience, probably a learning experience or something that broadens your horizons or whatever it might be. So when you are looking at your classes and you are going to be out in the field, make sure you have some experience in designing learning programs of all types. You know, sky's the limit type stuff if you can, because I think that that creative avenue can be very useful as well. Learning experiences uh, of all types. So there's a good one. User experience over collection development. Now, don't get mad at me. The collection will always be developed. We will always be doing those things. But I think an emphasis more on how our users experience the library is going to be so much more important than so much of the time that we spend getting the items out there and on the shelves. I think that is going to become so streamlined, we can shift things over. And finally, integration of technology to meet the needs of all users. And that means it's technology for people, not technology for technologies sake. Uh, I'll say just a couple more things here about tech. I don't think every person that gets an ML, ML, MLIS needs to be an experienced coder, but I think you need to know how to talk to the coders. It's good to, have, to dabble in the different areas to take uh, the classes that kind of give you that exposure, but do not feel you know you have to jump into and code with Python. Uh, and go from there. Sheila, last slide, and I'm gonna wind up here in two seconds. And finally, and I'd love it that all of my colleagues, I think almost all of my colleagues have mentioned soft skills. And um, we did a, a program a while ago, uh, a online conference about soft skills and wholehearted librarianship. And this is important. So as you choose your classes, please look for a class, look at those syllabi and look for assignments that allow you to be creative that allow you to do, make sure that you may be writing a paper, but maybe also allow you to make a video or to do audio or some creative type of presentation that really pushes creativity, uh, emphasizes curiosity and exploring all the cool things 
going on in the world. I'm really happy to get to talk to you all today. Uh, and I'm available. You can send me an email uh, with questions about the hyperlink library, about emerging technologies, et cetera. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was a fantastic mini closing uh, conference speech, I think, for our workshop today. And now we get to open the floor and the, um, the chat will be made active so that if you have any questions for any of our faculty advisors, um, or if you have questions about that certificate option, now's the time to go ahead and get into our chat and, um, and let's, let's hear what questions you have. Okay, first we have, first up we have Max. Um, he says, sorry, I was a few minutes late. Do you need to take more than 43 units to receive the certificate? So you do not take extra units to take the certificate. The digital assets certificate needs to be nine units taken out of your 27 units of electives for the MLIS program. So make sure that the classes for your certificate are also listed on your candidacy form. Um, same thing for the MARA program. They need to be coming out of your elective count. Um, next question, should you submit that form as soon as you are done or wait until before you graduate? You have to wait to submit that form until you have the grade of CR on your unofficial transcript after you've passed Info 289 or MARA 289. And then um, you'll submit that to the Dropbox in the advising site. I have a Dropbox just for a certificate audit forms. And then that will be approved at School of Information and we'll send that over to the Graduate Admissions and Programs Evaluator. Um, and then that, um, that's the sequence of, of when to turn that in. Okay, the next question. Do we do two certificates? No, you can only do one of the certificates. Any advice on how to promote the certificate on resumes, letters of interest, or within an interview? That's a great question. Um, I would think you would be able to um, note that in your like your LinkedIn profile. Do any of our faculty have other suggestions about how to promote the fact that they earned the certificate on top of their master's degree? Could I respond to that, Sheila? Yes, please. Um, I would definitely have it, um, as you said, on LinkedIn, um, in your resume, but the cover letter is really important. And I teach a marketing class every fall and we do a module on personal marketing. And it's really important that uh, you are able to showcase your skills um, in a way that uh, prospective employers will notice it. So um, the cover letter needs to start off with a sit up and take notice sentence. It's not, I am applying for the job that I saw advertised in X. You'd start off with some experience that you have or um, note that uh, in the X certificate that I earned at San Jose, these are the skills or start off with these are the skills. So yes, highlight it, highlight it, um, cover letter, note it in the resume, have it on LinkedIn. Back to great. You. great, yeah, great suggestions. Great question and great suggestions for how to highlight that. Yeah, um, that okay. okay, is there someone um, asking a question? Yeah, it's, it's Dara. I wanted to add to what uh, Dr. Allman just said. Fantastic. So um, you heard a lot of my colleagues say, and I didn't mention, but uh, you will do lots of hands-on projects in these courses. Uh, make sure that you uh, make those look good, that you have the links available. So, you know, after you finish, uh, if you do digital curation with me, you can show that Preservica project that you'll do and say, look, I understand how to apply the concepts of digital curation. Here is the, the um, collection that I've curated myself. And I think that that's something you can do with all of these courses to have uh, not just to say I have the certificate, but that you can show a deliverable where you have not just learned, but applied these skills. Great, fantastic. Another fantastic suggestion. Um, the next question I have is, can you pursue the emerging tech pathway and digital asset certificate with the same classes? 
yeah, you can, um, MLIS students can pursue multiple pathways. Um, the MLIS pathways are there as suggestions or guidance, but your actual MLIS degree will, will not state a pathway that you followed. And in fact, we do have um, many students who take classes from multiple MLIS pathways. The actual certificate, um, you need to choose um, nine units from those three specific digital assets um, pathways and note that you have 27 units of electives. So I do think it's possible for you to um, pursue the certificate and other pathways as well. We do have a tool on the website that shows you where there's crossover between um, pathways in the MLIS program. Dr. Stevens. Cool. I just can I just tuck something in here? Um, of course. I, I did a Zoom uh, last week with a student who is interested in uh, emerging tech, but also public librarianship and also uh, at management and leadership. So we looked at those three pathways together and I kind of did a little bit of the spiel that I, I told you all about, about having that background in understanding how people learn and programming as well as uh, emerging tech and then the leadership type stuff and kind of picking and choosing from that as well. Because even if you whatever library type you go into you do, and you don't want to be like the director or anything, it's still so useful to have uh, leadership skills as well. Thanks. Excellent. Excellent points. Okay, we'll go to the next question. Um, Tina asks, are there any competencies that the digital asset certificate courses don't satisfy? Um, there are a couple, there is one pathway that has um, a couple of MARA classes. When you look at that, um, the MARA, they will show, the syllabus will show the MARA competencies instead of the MLIS competencies. But remember that any student can use any um, artifact from any of their classes to relate to any of the competencies as long as you argue that well and you show examples of why that particular artifact um, satisfies that competency. I hope that answers that question. Um, the next question, um, if any of these certificate courses have prerequisites, are we to complete those before enrolling into a specific certificate course? Yes. And then let's see what else. Would the digital assets management certificate be beneficial for public librarianship? So I guess I'll send that back over to you, Dr. Stevens. Oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> do, you, sorry. do you think that um, digital assets management specifically could be helpful in a public library uh, position? I would say yes, if the library is of the size where they may be really working on maybe a digitization project or a lot of uh, digital objects. So you might want to aim toward uh, a larger uh, library size um, uh, for that. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, I see that my colleague Taryn has added the tool into the chat window that shows you how you can find courses in common to multiple MLIS pathways. So that's a really fancy and time-saving tool that you guys can use when you're planning out your electives. Um, the next comment was, um, Dr. Hoffman is willing to talk with anyone about um, how to map over those MARA competencies to the MLIS competencies. And remember, um, if you are interested in taking MARA classes, the MLIS students are allowed to transfer in up to nine units from other programs. That could be the MARA side of, of the house, or it could be um, our world language classes, or perhaps you took a class through the WISE consortium and you're taking another class from a different I school that you want to transfer in. So a lot of our um, MLIS students do take advantage of the, the MARA courses. Okay, looks like the next question is, um, the student is currently taking museum studies courses at other institutions and wants to work in an archivist capacity at a cultural heritage institution. 
would the certificate be a boost towards this goal? Do any of our faculty want to comment on this? Go ahead. Okay, I'm going to say yes. I think it would be helpful. Again, if the Cultural Heritage Institution had uh, that there was going to be a lot of technology involved, they had collections that they wanted to get out into people's hands or whatever, absolutely. Uh, and just one more thing for Aaron, who asked this question. I think that is absolutely fascinating and super cool that you're looking at, at you're taking museum studies and looking at library type stuff as well, because there's so much interesting stuff going on where museums and libraries overlap. I'll also mention that one of our certificate only students, so in other words, she came in not as an M-A-R-A, -A, MARA or M-L-I-S um, library student. She came in just to get the certificate. She's working as a field archeologist and she wanted to get the digital assets um, certificate because it helps her with her work. So I think there is a lot of crossover from different industries. Any other questions? Okay, Holly asks, can anyone speak more to the application of information governance pathway to specific branches of librarianship? I think this might be a question for Dr. Hoffman. You guys, you guys just get to listen to me all day today. <laughs> so yeah, InfoGov is, it's very much arisen out of archives and specifically records and information management, but every organization, including uh, libraries, has bodies of records that they need to make sure are um, uh, governed correctly so that they can meet maximum efficiency, that you can uh, provide accessibility, protect privacy of, pa of patrons and employees. These are all issues that are going to arise as much, I think, in librarianship going forward as in archives and records management. So if you are interested in that sort of side of the house, as it were, I think there's a lot of applicability to information governance, information assurance on the library side as well, especially I'd say in special libraries. Great, thank you. Okay, so do we have any other questions? Please feel free to type them into the chat window. This is an awesome opportunity to get to interact with so many of our wonderful faculty advisors at one time. So you have their ears. And so go ahead and don't be shy, uh, type, type any questions you might have. Um, you may have questions about their specific classes or their career path and how they got to be where they are today or other suggestions. Um, please don't, don't be shy. Oh, we have another one. Oh, uh, just a reminder um, how to reach Taryn and myself. Um, she's typed in our email addresses. Okay, so we missed one. Um, is it possible to receive the certificate before graduation with your MLIS? And the answer to that one is no. Um, it has to be, the certificate audit form has to be submitted um, after the grade of CR for either your uh, Info 289 or MARA 289 portfolio course has appeared on your unofficial transcript. The, um, uh, the graduate admissions and programs evaluator needs to see that grade in order to issue the certificate. Looks like we have another question. Are we allowed to have more than one advisor or is it recommended to stick with one advisor? So that's a great question, um, Samantha. What we do with the MLIS program is that we have a team-based um, advising model here at iSchool. So you have your student services advisors, which would be myself, Taryn, and Gina Lee. And you can reach out to us for questions about practical things like um, how to use the e-advising tools and to plan your program or how to look at your candidacy form if you want someone to talk that over before you submit it or referrals to any other advising resources that we have here in the iSchool or um, across San Jose State. But then our faculty pathway advisors are really there to answer very focused, specific questions about planning for a career 
in the areas where they specialize. And so if you're interested in more than one pathway, you're more than welcome to reach out to more than one faculty advisor because they will have um, strengths in their specific areas of the curriculum. So you're more than welcome to use our advising uh, menu on our toolkit to reach out to more than one advisor. Okay, so we have another question. Um, what are the options for pursuing a certificate after graduation? So if you were to receive your master's without fulfilling the nine units for the certificate, you could apply to the certificate program and then you would come in and you would need to take nine different units. So you wouldn't be able to carry over any of the earned units from your master's program into a new certificate. Okay, Elizabeth asks, can you speak more about the difference in the digital curation pathway and the archival studies pathway? So I think this would be either um, a question for Alice Scott or um, Dr. Hoffman, if either of you like to um, maybe try to answer a little bit more detail about this question. I think I can start. Um, uh, I think Dara can certainly I have a lot more to say about this, but there's a lot of overlap in those really. I can, you know, as I look at the, at both of those pathways, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of jobs that overlap in this area. And there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of course overlap too, for, for the most part. So I think it really just kind of depends on where you're heading in the end, you know. Um, so the archival studies is more, um, I think it's more about records management. It, it, there's more, there's a bit more of records management in there, I believe. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dara. <laughs> oh yeah, we love records management. That's uh, a core piece of what we do in the archive side. Um, and I like to, uh, I, I keep joking that uh, digital curation is a library archivist thing to do because yeah, you really have like that archives core in the OAIS and the digital uh, preservation piece, but then you have a lot of library services that are part of the digital curation uh, lifecycle of providing access and, you know, uh, user experience type of focus as well. Um, so yeah, I concur with Alice. It's really kind of about where you want to go and how you want to focus, but both can get you to similar places, just sort of along different paths, if that makes sense. And um, wouldn't you say that the archival um, MLIS pathway is broader than the digital curation pathway, meaning that um, there would be more content for um, paper-based archiving? I mean, would there be, would it be a narrower form of um, specializing to do di digital curation? Well, for sure, if you're talking, because are, are we talking like, I guess I was unclear in the question um, and that maybe the student can clarify. Do you mean like the um, information governance certificate versus the digital curation certificate I or think, like MARA versus MLIS? I think they were thinking, if I'm not mistaken, they were thinking digital curation pathway in the MLIS versus the archives um, and preservation pathway within the MLIS. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, I'd say that um, you're probably, yeah, I think that's exactly right, Sheila. There's more about like analog uh, archives, records management and such with that particular pathway versus digital curation. Fantastic. There's also more, oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> There's also more opportunity for learning about preservation of physical objects in the archival one. Great. As opposed to digital objects, I mean. Right. Um, let's see. I'm scrolling back up to make sure I haven't missed anyone. Um, any idea or stat on how many MLIS and MARA students graduate with one of these certificates? Um, I have. I. I um, do have some stats on that. Um, they are the numbers are growing with every semester as we get word out about this. Um, we've we've had several hundred of students already um, complete the certificate option, but 
um, again, it's a really wonderful opportunity you have to take to take advantage at no extra cost. So I'm hoping more and more students will pursue this option. Um, the next question is, um, let me scroll down here. A class recommendation for students that do not currently have a technical background. Um, anybody feel they want to take this one? I would say get your feet started with um, with 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 the Info 240, perhaps. I know that a lot of students enjoy that class. Um, Dr. Stevens, yes. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, this is a good question. And really, once you start 203, you're starting to kind of get get into things. But once you get through the core, I think it is a good thought to maybe look at, at 240, uh, especially maybe just a, that bit of like web design, maybe a little taste of programming languages. Um, and I see Michelle said hyperlink library. Absolutely, you can get a lot of dabble around with a lot of technology that way. The good thing is, and let's, let's kind of come back a little bit um, with your question. If you are in the ML, MLIS, you are experiencing WordPress in 200, you are actively writing a blog, you are creating a digital artifact. Uh, so you are doing technical things and you are building your skill set. So what I would say is take all of that in, take all of that in as experience, and then just kind of keep pushing yourself a little bit. Take that 240 that looks interesting. Take a 287, like hyperlink libraries or one of the other classes and uh, just kind of push yourself a bit. It's always good to seek a challenge. Excellent, excellent advice. I think we have time for one more question. Um, can and, I uh, ask something? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah well, um, I would also suggest that you really look into the syllabus or even reach out to the instructor directly. And because I've got a lot of questions and emails about students not having a technical background, but they still want to take the big data course. Can I do it? Can I not? So I think it would be really helpful to be more proactive and just reach out to the instructors and ask you know, what kind of expectation they have in terms of your technical background. And also, um, I'm not trying to promote my courses again, but um, like even my course is more like, you know, for example, big data analytics and management. I have been really mindful of my student population. And I know that people come from a wide range of different backgrounds and some are really tech savvy while some of are, you know, like the really first class of doing some little programming. So, um, but so far I hope and I believe that most of my students have been doing really well. And um, it's such a pleasure to see a lot of them kind of gain that technical skills at the end of the semester. So again, I really like, like uh, Michael suggest, uh, Dr. Um, Steven suggested, um, try to push yourself a little bit and, you know, just um, take it from there. And I'd like to just pop in um, and add to both um, Dr. Chen and Dr. Stevens. If you look at the job ads to see what it is you're, that really appeals to you, then look for the courses um, that will help you gain those skills. And um, someone earlier mentioned that there are no prerequisites. You know, if the course does not have a prerequisite, then you'll be able to get into it if you don't have the technical skills and you'll be learning as you go. So you really need to make sure that um, you're taking courses that are going to advance you and to talk to the instructor before you sign up to see if it's uh, what you want and what you need. Such excellent pro tips from, um, from all of our faculty today. We have time for one more question and I think that we will wrap it up. Um, the question is, can we just start our nine units whenever without notifying anyone during the program and then just submit the form when we graduate? Yes, the answer is yes, that we make it easy. So you would um, keep track of these classes Make sure you're taking the exact topics that are mentioned on the pathways. And then when the time comes, you would go ahead and submit your form. 
And um, if you have any follow-up questions about the certificate option, feel free to reach out to me. I think um, you all know how to find me um, or one of our student services team and, and, and let us know what questions you have. Um, we have one more comment that the job ads often mention specific tools. And then how can we know what courses will give you the hands-on experience with these? And I think Dr. Chen mentioned um, that all students should be spending quite a bit of time looking at the previous syllabi of the courses that, that, that they're interested in because many of our faculty mention very specific details about uh, what the projects are in the classes. And if you have questions, you can feel free to reach out to them. So I want to thank uh, my co-moderator, Taryn, um, who helped with managing all of the behind the scenes work today. I'd like to thank all of our six wonderful faculty for spending their lunch break with us today and sharing their knowledge in all of the um, LIS areas of specialty. And so please um, make sure that you reach out when you, whenever you have questions. Um, use the tools that we pro provided for you in the advising toolkit. Use your student success planner and all the wonderful tools. And then um, reach out to us by either instant chat on the website or make an advising appointment with Taryn or myself. And we hope to speak with you all soon. So thanks again.